Sir, for this new hat, who is the worst rugby pundit you've ever seen on a show? John Bradshaw Layfield. Thank you. This is the Rugby Odds, where an unlikely pundit panel of a wordsmith, a WWE legend, a rugby star, and a supermodel scour the globe, seeking best bets and bad behavior. Are you not entertained? Thank you, thank you, but uh, your suit does not deserve any accolades this week. I had a bad weekend at the office in terms of picking matches, but if you look in the Sponsor Opportunity Green Room, we're three people, not just one. We're a team, and John Bradshaw Layfield, the WWE Hall of Famer, and King Gipte Bailu, his compadre, uh, the inventor of words, they help bail me out and actually help you as well. So look at the your company name here, Slate, hint, Hint, we have a very busy day, including welcoming back George Hook from his mini sabbatical. And let's bring in John and Gift. Guys, 19 and 17, and I owe you an apology. I was horrific. And I again, I blame Paul Boyle. More on that later. But I was 5 and 7. You guys bailed us out, go to each going 7 and 5 in what was a ridiculous week in terms of favorites and home teams just letting us down. We won our portion of the record, and we don't call it ridiculous. No, you did. You, you did. You, you know, that's why we're a team. You know, there's no I in team, John. We're really not a team. <laughs> Gene, Gene to Bailey and I are partners, and you really not part of that. Bam. All right. All right. And since I had such a poor week, I'm just going to accept the wooden spoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm in the walk of shame. <laughs> Hard to believe yours truly getting both of these accolades or dubious distinctions in the same week. You had a record this past week about as good as the MLR. <clears throat> Ow! Oh! You know, it's too soon to be joking about <laughs> people's livelihoods being lost, okay? <laughs> Little Mr. Uh, oh, I've had my career. I don't care about anyone else's. <laughs> okay? Gift! Let's, let's segue. Let's change gears. How about talking a little sevens with us just briefly briefly because i can't say this enough look one yo shout out australia argentina i think argentina is becoming greatly a dark horse in this process and could actually be a dark horse to win the olympics over fiji they're ridiculous and then australia charlotte Catholic, fine as i don't know what but is a beast on the field and that entire field is ridiculous they've just gone back to back demolishing the u.s to get there and usa women you improved, so I'm not even mad. They went from eight to four. Yeah. But USA men, outside mm. of Malachi Easdale, like, I don't understand what's going on with them. You're ending at 11. You didn't even get out of the quarterfinals. You had freaking Ireland and France as your two biggest competitions. You could have come out. You beat Great Britain. You almost lost to them. I, I don't know what's going on over with the USA men, but I'm seeing another losing campaign for the Olympics and another – loss out of the ability of getting at least copper. I don't even know if we can get copper right now. The one team that's arguably as confounding as the United States is Great Britain. They've got th they've got three three countries. They've got an all-star team in the, you know. They got an all-star, but that's their problem. They got an all-star team. They mollywopped us in the Olympics last year. So right now I'm kind of enjoying the fact that we can just beat up on them while they still have to figure out their stuff. But if we can't get that stuff together like this this isn't going to get pretty anytime soon. But. It's bleak at best, but let's shed some sunlight. Let's bring in George Hook now. George, good to see you. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! George Hook is back! Welcome back! Yeah! Welcome All back! Right. Welcome back! That's what we're talking about. <laughs> oh, this made our year! It was it was purgatory here for me last week without you. I'm sorry to hear that, but um, it, the, my great hero, Winston Churchill, uh, every now and again used to uh, fall victim to black depression. <laughs> and I have to tell you, last Monday uh, in London, I was in black depression. When you uh, change euros to sterling, it makes a big difference. <laughs> it's actually cheaper to buy dollars. The mighty dollar is uh, softy. It's a softy. 
That segues nicely back to rugby. George, what caught your eye this weekend? Well, obviously, um, remember I'm from Cork. So Munster is my team. And and you can never, no matter how long I've been left Cork, you can't take Munster away from me. So a huge disappointment at the Munster draw. On the other hand, um, Leinster, who've been beaten by La Rochelle now for the last two years in 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 finals, it got a win away from home, which I think was a tremendous achievement. I think uh, it's a slight misnomer to call this the European Champions Cup when you got South Africans in it. But the Bulls, I thought, laid down a marker. Uh, in their win over Saracens. I'll, I'll just tell John Leahy that uh, the Zebras uh, lost again, uh, which I think is going to be their station in life for the rest of the year. And Benetton, who are effectively fifth in the championship, were beaten but played quite well. So that's a kind of rough overview of the weekend, really, apart from some of the more disappointing things that happened. George, Paul Boyle threw the whole weekend to skew by talking about how Bordeaux was going to struggle with the, the sports ground in Galway and talking about the little locker room and the wind and the cold and the rain. And he gave Bordeaux's coaching staff something to pin up on the bulletin board in the locker room, and they came out and smoked Connacht. And that threw the whole weekend off. That's that. That's what I, I was thinking. Did, did you catch any of that? Connacht was just bad. But, but I mean, Boyle talking about the weather in Galway is hardly to make the headlines in an Irish newspaper. I mean, the weather in the west of Ireland isn't really a talking point in <laughs> Ireland. You know, I mean, it rains over there all the time. So, I mean, what's new? Uh, so, uh, I thought he was talking claptrap. He should just shut up. Yeah, Ireland has three months of bad weather followed by winter, I think is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, I love the Emerald Isle. I don't like Matt, but he's not from there. Uh, so, George, got a question for you with uh, Saracens. I know an observation, but a question. Saracens was the only team that lost. The Premiership boat raced a bunch of teams, which I think was surprising to a lot of people. Fans out there like to question – who is the best league? Who is it? Uh, URC is a premiership is a top 14 between these three, except for Saracens, which was playing down an altitude in Africa and had Maro Toji out for uh, a yellow card for a big part of the second half. Uh, their only team that lost premiership had stellar results. Who, in your opinion, and is this indicative of premiership is the best league between these three? You've got to talk about the premiership in the context of the English national question. We are now having more, Farrell was the first, but we're now having more and more players saying, we're not going to play for England this year. We're going to take a rest. Now, in 150 years, nobody ever turned down an invitation yeah. to play for their country. Nobody. Now, because these guys are earning their corn from the actual clubs, they're delivering for the clubs. It's always been a very competitive league, despite losing three great clubs in Worcester Wasps and London Irish. Short answer to your question is that the Premiership is a very difficult competition, even still in its weaker position. Gift, since you're the closest thing that we have to somebody that's French, what did you notice this weekend? Or co Coach, you're right. Shout out to South Africa being the only thing that could be competitive against any of the premiership teams with the Stormers doing something and, of course, Rossing 92 against the Harlequins because France didn't really do anything except for what, what La Rochelle barely getting anything through. I, I have to have questions about whether or not this that whole side is worth it. Is the top 14 actually good? And then the other thing was, I actually liked this competition. This felt like the club version of the Rugby World Cup, in my opinion. You know, like, we got to see a little bit of the combination of all. If this had just been the European Championships, I think it might have not been as interesting. But add South Africa into it, it made it worth watching. We have to take a commercial break now. We'll be right back. <laughs> 
Need a great price on a new vehicle? Sheehy makes it easy. Easy Price shows you our lowest prices on the Mid-Atlantic's largest selection. Find your best price online or at any of our 31 dealerships. It's easy at Sheehy. Sheehy.com. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. And we're back with George Hook, John Layfield, and Gift Day Baylou. John, do you have something you want to talk to George about? I do want to ask Mr. Hook this question about rugby in America, specifically United States of America. You had two teams that were canceled, that were not going to play this next year, and they were major markets. New York, one of the biggest media markets in the world. Toronto, one of the biggest media markets, certainly in Canada, also, but also in the Northern Hemisphere. Those that's going to kill any TV deals for this year with MLR, but does it do anything to the potential of the world cup being in America? When you add to that fact, the U S men's national team has a really hard time winning an inter squad scrimmage right now, much less being competitive on the national level. Well, there have been severe debts expressed in Europe about uh, whether the 2031 rugby world cup scheduled for America can can survive financially. Uh, and now the news you've just broken makes that worry even greater. Uh, and and uh, like I don't speak about America like some fellow over in Ireland looking across the Atlantic. I've lived there, I've coached there, I've worked there uh, with, with American rugby. American rugby hasn't made a shred of progress since I co- helped coach the national team in 1987. I think there's a huge doubt about the 2031 Rugby World Cup being in America, followed two years later by the Women's uh, World Rugby uh, Cup. In 2033. Uh, yep. The women's game is less reliant on funding and sponsorship and television and all that sort of thing. But the men's game is absolutely dependent. I don't, I mean, if you were to ask me now, would I put 10 bob? Now, 10 bob uh, hasn't been around in Irish currency for about 50 <laughs> years, but it's roughly the equivalent uh, of uh, half a dollar. Uh, I wouldn't put 10 bob on this tournament taking place in America. Wow. I disagree. Maybe I'm the eternal optimist, but I think they'll get the New York franchise back. I think they'll get another Canadian franchise. And they may even get a Mexican franchise, but we do have the venues. They just have to be modified. And the soccer. There's a a great guy down in Mexico. He's a hotshot tight head. Pancho (laughs) Villa, I think his name is. He's a real hotshot. He wrestled against John. Yeah, the Mexicans didn't do well with him. You have a venue in Rome for gladiators, but we're not having gladiators come back. Okay. Just because you have a venue, it it could stay empty. Listen. You've just demonstrated that you're a communist and not a true American. And let's go to the true American, Mr. Gift de Belu. Gift, you got something for George? Well, look, you know, if I'm going to stick to the transition of offense, I kind of want to talk what's going on with <laughs> Owen Farrell. And then also kind of in addition to with Tom Foley, the both of them taking like this leave of time off uh, based off of the proverbial abuse that they received from the media and the public and whatnot. John. Now, from your side, and and look, I know you've also dealt with the nonsense as well, too. What is the state of, like, media discourse in its actual reality versus what's the actual, like, uh, what the what the actual presentation of it is? Because it seems like that fan, you know, heavy critique, heavy anger is a normal thing. But I used to think the U.S. had a worse version of it until you started to see these people do it. So... For you, what is the take on the situation with this mental health break from the conversations? Yeah, well, I mean, there's two sides to this. There's the media, and the media are only doing their job, you know. The media's job is to sell newspapers or, or radio or television or whatever it is. But what really disappointed me is that the captain of England, and he is, and whatever you think about him as a person, one of the great fly halves in modern day rugby, Owen Farrell is booed at the weekend. 
Um, and then you go to Munster, you find a French player is manhandled by a member of the crowd. Now, I have to tell you that in all my years in playing, coaching, managing, doing everything about rugby, I never thought that would happen. It was a great phrase by Victoria who said that soccer was a game for gentlemen played by tugs. And rugby was a game for thugs played by gentlemen. And I actually I actually believed that implicitly. As this game of ours was above that sort of thing. And I'm deeply hurt and disappointed about it. And the game is going. I, I can't find one direction where the game of rugby is going in a better direction. When that's playing, laws, refereeing, crowd, anyone, it's going the wrong direction. And like in 2031, I'll be 90, and I'm not expecting to be there. Oh, um, well, you'll be there. You, I'm not even sure if the game as we know it will be there in 2031. On a serious note, George, I wanted to bring up the loss of a rugby legend a man that you knew, Sid Miller, and what you could tell us about him. Well, if you look at the the entire history of rugby union and you take out the number of years where because of the apartheid regime in South Africa, South Africa did not play international rugby, South Africa have been invariably the best team in the world. I may not go down very well in Wellington and Auckland, but it is a fact. And, and the World Cup has proven that. So this great rugby nation, the Lions go down there. And the Lions for the uninitiated are a team consisting of Welsh, Scotland, Ireland, and English players. And they invariably went to tour and they played 30 matches. In 74, Miller brought the Lions down there as coach. And they won every, not every, every single game by the last one, where thanks to a hometown referee, he managed to get a draw for South Africa. But they won every match plus a draw. Now, that is remains an extraordinary achievement. Never done before by a European team, that is. Never done since. But there are also some great things like it. If you, normally what the South Africans did to the to the lily-livered Europeans was to kick the living you know what out of them. And that they so Miller said we're not taking this crap anymore, right? If they hit one of us, they hit all of us, right? So they had this 99 call. So when some big springbok hit a lion. The other 14 guys all joined in the fray. And there was a monumental punch up. The referee didn't know what the hell was going on. The great J.P.R. Williams fullback said, I had to run 50 yards to get into the row. Right? <laughs> but what they did was they proved, and more importantly, they proved to South Africa that they were no longer the kingpins. And nobody else had done that. And then Miller who'd been a great Irish loose head, who had been a great Irish coach, became, and this is the most important thing, he became head of what is now World Rugby. It was the international board in those days. And he was magnificent. Now, you know, all when all these new laws are bringing in, they're experimental laws, and they're subject to acres of research and all this thing. Miller just said, you know, instinctively, I think this is what the law should be. And it worked. And we were lucky in Ireland. We had Sid Miller, we had the late Tommy Kiernan, and we had Ronnie Dawson, who's with us still, age 90. Those three guys, when professionalism came in, did such a fabulous job for us that the smallest nation on rugby earth eventually became number one nation in the world. It's an extraordinary achievement. And these three guys did it. And Miller was part of it. That's the first line of a joke, right? Going into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> 
But, you know, 37 times for Ireland, 39 mm-hmm. times for the Lions. That's uh, extraordinary. Yeah. Three Lions tours. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. Well, listen, we were going to let you go, but I want to take a quick break and bring you back and just get a rapid fire answer from you on the four Irish provinces in the upcoming weekend. We'll be right back. You need your cleats? You need them tomorrow? If you order today by 3 p.m. New York time or noon L.A. time, they can have them to you tomorrow. Young, old, male, female, if you're playing on turf, if you're playing on grass, if you're playing in the rain, you're playing in the heat, they've got you covered. RugbyNow.com. Go there now. And we're back. George, you got us on the edge of our seats because we're looking at these games. We're trying to pick them because I was horrific last week, and these guys actually bailed me out a little bit. Uh, so I'm I'm, I'm, sh- I'm I'm fishing for some expertise. Let's look at Connacht going into Saracens. What do you think of that one? Connacht to lose. Uh, I can give you rapid fire here. Connacht to lose. Ulster to win. Munster to lose. Leinster to win. Not sure about the spreads, but they're the results. Thank you, George. Once again. All right, bringing, George. Huh? Bringing yeah. some class and some knowledge to this program that is sorely, sorely lacking. Speaking of analysis, Gift, why don't you talk to us about what you observed with the top 14 last weekend? When we talk about France, we talk about the choke job because France was favorites to take this one for all their games. And just like they did in the Rugby World Cup, when it mattered most, they dropped the ball. Went one and three with Bayonne going against Munster. And even though that's a draw, apparently we're going to consider that as a loss to them, which I'm okay with because I like making fun of France. It's the Louisiana in me that does it right. You know, we got Lyon <laughs> losing to Bristol. We had Stade Francais losing to South Sharks. We had uh, La Rochelle losing to East West Coast Leicester. West Coast uh, uh, Leinster, I'm sorry, out of Ireland. Give the proper respect where it is. Sorry, George. And it's just consistent all the way around. And then, of course, Toulon, that was supposed to be a favorite overall, yeah. just getting mollywopped by Exeter because the premiership, though, gets paid nothing and top 14 gets all the money. The results do not equate the same. But, hey, you know, whenever we drink wine and eat biscuits and just can take the debts, we do what we got to do. No worries. <laughs> What can you tell us about the premiership, John? Because I'm going to tell us about the URC. I like the idea of the two hemispheres. I like the idea of the different countries. But premiership is the premier league right now. I I don't see any other way around it. I mean, they destroyed competition this past week. Look, we have one set set of data. You have to go by what you have. You don't have, oh, I don't know. Maybe next year we're going to be really good. No, right now. Premiership is the one that is standing number one. They have one lost game, and that was down in South Africa at at altitude with their arguably their number one or number, at least top one of the top three players, Marwa Toji, out for a good part of the second half. Ten minutes. So that was a heck of a showing by I look. I sell was amazing. Uh, Lester was amazing. I mean, these guys took it to these teams. They molly whopped them. Big disappointment in the URC. John, I know you love the URC like you love Mario Otoje, Jamie George, and Owen Farrell. And if you could, you would have your nose up every single player's ass in the URC as you do with those three that players. That's so not nice. It's you're not just, nice, but it's true. It's hey, true. wait a minute. Wait a minute. The mental health of Owen Farrell, you're one of the trolls that George was talking about. You. Exactly. You. Exactly. You. Separated from the game. Separated. Yep. Mm-hmm. I respect the guy as a player, and I would like him on my team. But and you put out all kinds of stuff about him. On I don't social put out media. anything about, about what are you talking about? You oh, I'm, talk about I'm home all the tweeting time. about Owen Farrell. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. No, I think he gets away with bloody murder when uh, penalties are concerned. As for the URC, you awful. double down. Why don't you troll? <laughs> that's not abusing the guy. That's pointing out that he, I'm blaming the referees more than I'm, I'm. Admit you're a troll. Admit you are a troll. I'm a troll. Okay. okay. All right. The URC, two and six overall versus the spread. Absolutely awful. You hold, you heard George talking about the Irish teams. Munster, inexcusable in their draw. Just inexcusable. And now, you know, what's going to happen next week? But the French, as Git just pointed out, just as bad. Three of the four teams that were favored 
URC teams did not come. Two of them lost outright. Munster had the draw against Bayonne, not New Jersey, but the team from France. And against the spread, one and three. Just awful. That trend should reverse a little bit when we're looking at the matches that are coming up. And we're each going to make a pick after this break. We'll be right back. From New York City comes America's longest running and most popular rugby show. The biggest names in Major League Rugby, MLR highlights, and big match previews. Rugby Wrap Up presents MLR Weekly, made in New York City. And we're back. Gift, give us a pick. Look, look, I'm going back to the people I just referenced. Bulls versus Lyons, they're fake lion, and uh, give it to the Bulls because they're about to ram through another one. <laughs> That's a violation of the Sixth Amendment. <laughs> John, who do you like? Sale and Leinster. I think Leinster wins, but Leinster played an incredible game. They've been terrible conditions against a rival in their hometown. They come back home, 24 and a half points is too many points. Give me Sale to cover 24 and a half points. Is it Sell or Sale? What I just said, it's sell. And and Munster over Exeter. How about that? All right. So you're gonna well, hey, if right. you, you hang around long, I'll just keep making picks. Munster right. over Exeter. I think okay. Munster played terrible last week and they're gonna roll extra in a in a hostile environment. There's gonna be, be a good game. All right. I'm gonna go with say uh, bath smoking Cardiff in Cardiff. How about your picks of the week? Gift. Keep talking about Ulster, keep talking about Rossing, but you better put some respect on Rossing 92's name. On the road, taking on Ulster. Look for them to get the win and cover the points because it's only one and a half. John. See a Khaleesi. Boom. See a Khaleesi. <laughs> Bam. La Rochelle blew the game last week. Now, no, no mistake about it. Leinster won the game, but La Rochelle lost their part of the game. They, they, they had so many mistakes of kicks. They had so many mistakes in that weather. They didn't handle the adversity like Leinster did. I think they're going to correct that this week. They are a great team. They're going out to South Africa to play the Stormers. I think they not only cover, I think they win the game. Wow. That's a gutsy call. That's a gutsy call. Foolish, if you ask me. I didn't ask you, did I? Did I once ask you? you no, I didn't ask five, you. You were under 500 last week. So if you're yeah. like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm look like, at my over, look at so, my overall. So you record. are a contrarian indicator. So now I feel much better about it because you hate it. I like Lester. Get eight and a half in Paris versus Stade Francais. On that note, we're out of time. I want to yes, thank God goodness Brad we're out Show of time. And feel the WWE Hall of Famer King Gift Day Bailey, the inventor of words George Hook, the Irish legend. Thank you for tuning in. Please check out our other shows, including MLR Weekly, the College Rugby Wrap Up. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Sign up for our weekly newsletter, and please join our American Red Cross blood donor team. It's a yard sale. Would you go home?